We're always looking for ways to understand God, understand in quotes. Uh, an example is, in my class we've been talking about uh, what do we mean when we say heaven. And we've been using various poems, to 20th century poems, to look at the ways in which artists have, poets have imagined heaven. Um, or even some state of mind which they would never call heaven, but which is clearly beyond this world. And the inclination is to make heaven a projection of our own experience. Poets want to make it a projection of memory. It's, it's most often some idealized version of the past that they can step into in the future. And, and uh, you'll find that in poet after poet, very great poets like Seamus Heaney, Richard Wilbur, you'll find that in, in their work. Um, what you don't find very often is a willingness to, uh, to let that experience be something completely other than you would understand or than you would have, have resources for articulating. And I think that's what we do in church all the time, too. I once heard a preacher say, well, it was a liberal Protestant service, and so he said, well, you know, the, the, the notion of heaven is just too preposterous for us, right? It's too, we, we can't imagine that individual consciousness would survive our deaths. And I thought, no, that the problem actually is that it's not preposterous enough, that what we are doing is projecting our own selves beyond death and, and not allowing death to teach us something. So I think we, we reduce God to some term in which we can understand him. As Seamus Haney says, glimmerings are what the soul is composed of. Glimmerings are what the soul is composed of. Yeah. And if you ask me how I envision God, I have no theology for you. Um, if you ask me, do I get glimpses of God? Yes, I get these glimmerings of, of um, intuitions stronger than that, really, where the existence of God seems to me absolute. And, and, uh, and somehow I, I hold on to those through my life uh, uh, into some sort of, it's not a picture of God. You know, Abraham Joshua Heschel, the Jewish theologian, says that what we are faithful to is, is we become faithful to those times when we had faith in our lives. There's not some object or formulation of God that you're faithful to. We go through these, we all go through our lives and then suddenly we'll have a moment when, when we think, I have faith right now in something. And maybe it's in church, or maybe it's in love, or maybe it's in death, or whatever. And, and Heschel says that if you're going to be a faithful person, then what, what you learn is to be faithful to those moments. It's a discipline of memory. And I find that I've had these moments in my life when I have been overcome by what I only know to call God. And most of my life is not like that. It is, I feel bereft of God. And so uh, if I try to envision God, if I try to think of what faith is, it is remaining faithful to those moments. Poetry had always been the place where I had experienced God. And, and, the place, and it's still the place where I feel lifted out of myself and given something that I could not understand in any other way. Uh, it's just that it happens so rarely, you can't, it's a hard thing to pin your life on, you know. I, I go to church, and I need church, and I need the ritual of church, um, and, and I'm a fan of, of liturgies, and, and I'm not, I don't think that you can simply overturn thousands of years of, of religion and say, oh, we need a new, you know, here, let's make a new language. But language is not a static thing in any form, and it probably is particularly not a static thing when you're talking about something as volatile as religious experience. And, in my experience, the artists that I know, even though they wouldn't call themselves Christian, some would, uh, but they are the ones who are fighting to remake some kind of language to connect us with the ineffable, with the divine, and to, to, to forge or reforge or reanimate those connections. And I think it's often happening in strange places. I have no qualms with thinking of my poetry as religious poetry. I have friends who worry that they'll be discounted, I mean, it's a secular world, the world of literature, and they're, they'll be discounted or not taken as seriously uh, if they're considered religious writers, but I just can't worry about that. I've got too much else to worry about. You can't systematize God. You cannot systematize God. 
So the whole notion of systematic theology is doomed from the outset. It doesn't mean it's, you know, that you throw it away as a discipline, but, but the notion that you can systematize God, most systematic theologians know this. I mean, you, uh, um, it, you, it's often built into, especially with someone like Paul Tillich, built into the theology, sometimes not so much. Um, and so that's my main question, my main problem. I, I, I find the imagination a much truer uh, uh, barometer of my relationship with God than I do my rational intellect. And systematic theology is often relying on rational intellect. That's a crude distinction, which I'll regret making, no doubt, but at any rate. Um, but I don't, but you know, like I say, I feel I am a child of my time. I am a, a creature of reason. We are living through a second enlightenment. I am very much um, a, a person of reason. And uh, I want to understand God. I believe God that is, God is to some degree understandable. And he means for his life, or her life, or its life to be understood by us. And, and, uh, Systematic theology is a way of doing that. My life as a poet makes me sympathetic to the notion of, of reality being sacred. And, and, uh, and I think the incarnation uh, uh, is a warrant for that, is, is, a, is a sort of metaphysical warrant for the fact that reality is sacred. Reality is sacred because uh, God became flesh, God became human. That's the reason reality is sacred. And so that's why it makes sense to me. I used to be obsessed with death, and I would say I'm not obsessed with death anymore. Uh, I think when we're young, we're often, particularly an artist is, maybe just an artist, is obsessed with death in a way, and it becomes subject matter. And you, you lack means of intensity in your life when you're young, and so you might turn to something like death. And uh, there, there are numerous poets who have done it, from great poets to mediocre poets, great like Keats mediocre like Swinburne, um, mid-range like Plath. There are all kinds of poets who have done it. Um, and I think if you get older, then you see death in a different way, like Seamus Heaney managed to do in a bunch of his middle poems especially, but some of his late poems as well, where it almost seems like he was seeing through death. I think that there is always a tension between uh, solitary religious experience and, and the community uh, in which that religious experience is uh, expressed and tested, uh, um, and also uh, a tension between the life of the poet, which is solitary, and the life of the poet, which cannot be completely solitary, or you won't have anything to write about. You won't have, you won't have any material to write about. You'll lose your connection with the world, unless you are the strangest kind of genius, like Emily Dickinson, but that's very rare, very rare. Writing for me always starts in sound. Um, uh, I think of sound as, as being divinely expire, inspired. I, uh, I will hear often a cadence before I even have words for the cadence. Um, and then I might have a few words that I start to hear and the cadence will take over and I'll need to find the words that fit the rest of the cadence. But it's not an idea, it's not an image, it's not, uh, it's not a memory that I had, it's sound. And I'm following that sound uh, to try to get to its source. And it's, an, it's a real anguish while it's happening because there's a feeling of if you don't get this it's going to drive you crazy. And, and you're going to lose it, and so you're, you're, it can really take over your life while it's happening. My mind is filled with the Bible. We used to have to um, recite verses before we could start eating at our table. Um, we kept a little, a little thing there, um, and you would pull it out, and it had the, had the verse and the number, and then you'd have to say it, you know, whatever, whatever you drew, then you'd have to say the verse. Um, but yeah, my, my mind is filled with that, and I, I still hear, even more than the specific content of those verses, what I'm most aware of are the cadences of the Bible, which come back in my writing, and which I notice in other people's writing, and which I dearly love when I come across 
the writing of, of novelists like Cormac McCarthy or Marilyn Robinson or Fanny Howe, they all managed to incorporate that very beautifully.